Well, good morning. You know, back in the day, about, this goes, rewind the tape here about 50 years, uh, 52 years. Uh, when I first got out of college, I became the high school basketball and football coach at St. Paul, Minnesota there at a high school of about 3,000 kids. And uh, when we watched game film, we watched it on an 8 millimeter, maybe 16 millimeter projector. How many of you even remember an 8 millimeter projector? Okay. Well, we watched game film and, and we didn't have, we, we, if we wanted to run a play backwards, we had to actually stop the projector, re-thread it, move it backwards, and then try it again. Then my second year of coaching, they had a little toggle switch which we could move it back and forth. Well, it doesn't even compare what they have today. And you couldn't really stop a play and look at it because if you did, you'd burn the film. But today they can do it backwards and forwards. Now the only thing that hasn't changed, the only thing that hasn't changed, is that the reason we watch game film is because we want to know what the opponent's going to do. I can tell you that uh, Coach Wade today, or this last week, has been watching all the film he could find on the San Diego Chargers to find out what they're capable of doing for today's, today's game around 2 o'clock. You want to know what the opponent's going to do. There was a clip we were going to try to show today, but we're not going to be able to do it because of the, the complications of our system, but it was a little clip from a movie called Identity Crisis. Melissa McCarthy, who's kind of a funny lady, is, uh, is the one who steals the identity of somebody. And this guy catches her right in the middle of the act. And uh, he uh, presents her with some evidence. And when she has to realize that he's, she's now caught, he turns to her and says, gotcha. Now, if you're, if you're doing that in chess, the word for gotcha is called checkmate. If you're a Mines student and you just took a test that the you're sure the professor over at Mines was trying to really nail you, and you ace it, you can turn to the professor and say, gotcha. If, 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 you're, if, if, you're, if you're winning the ball game and you defeat the enemy at the end of the game, as you're running out to shake hands with the other coach, one coach is not saying it, but he's thinking, gotcha. We do try to understand our opponents and our enemies. And sometimes we as Christians need to take a little time and watch a little game film to see what the opponent's up to. And we need to stop it frame by frame sometimes to see where and are the maneuvers so we can be ready. And when we see something come together and we see the Lord work and we see His mighty hand upon us and we see Him do exactly what He said in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good for those who love and trust Him and are called according to His purpose. When those things happen, it's almost like we whisper under our breath to Satan. Say it with me. Gotcha. I, I love that word. It's a crazy word, isn't it? Gotcha. But it's a great word, especially especially when you're on top. It brings a little smile to your face at times, doesn't it? Understanding Satan's strategy. There's five areas that anyone who wants to attack our nation will attack. Some of the generals say that they won't just attack these areas, these five areas, one at a time. They'll do them all at once. Those five areas are vulnerable areas, security, Communication, supply, and intelligence. That's warfare. I still remember that clip from Patton as he's uh, at the Battle of the Bulge and he's defeating Rommel with the tanks. Now, General Patton was a God-fearing man, but he had a little problem with his mouth from time to time. And he's looking through the binoculars and he's seeing the American division beat the Germans out there on the tank field and, and he turns to him and he says, 
I read your book, Rommel. <laughs> and then he says something profane, but basically what he was saying was, gotcha. This is kind of interesting. Satan uses those five strategies to attack our lives. Our vulnerable areas, security, communication, supply, and intelligence. What's Jesus doing to fight this battle? Do we need to watch a little game film to see how we can be better prepared for this? Spiritual warfare is not something we prepare for in case of war. We're at war daily, folks. And the enemy is on attack on all sides. There's a book that was written, well, not even a book, it was more of a postcard, the book of Jude. And I want you to plug into the narrative with me at verse 17, only one chapter, verse 17 that says this. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's Spirit in them. Verse 20, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will, keep, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourselves safe in God's love. Verse 22, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. <laughs> what a graphic picture. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Now this part of the epistle is addressed to us about how to survive in times of apostasy. We're running some game film today because many people today, many theologians, many pastors, Many church members do not know when Jesus is going to come back, but we all sense we might be living in the last days. Probably a good time to run some game film. See what the enemy's up like to. Now this is a part of the epistle that Jude is writing is addressed to us about how to survive in times of apostasy. But before we get to that text, I want to just go back for a minute and talk about when the church was actually born at Pentecost. You know, the new life of the church was obviously phenomenal. It was exhilarating. It was pure. It was powerful. It was productive. No question about it. These people in the, new, in the first century were devoted to prayer and worship, the apostles' doctrine. They gathered every day with one another and engaged in all those things, including being generous, and, 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 and being faithful and even giving of whatever they had to each other. The result was a powerful evangelistic impact upon the world. And that early church grew in just a few weeks from 3,000 on Pentecost to an excess of over 20,000 embracing the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It was a powerful time in the church. The early chapters of the book of Acts, do they not tell and chronicle the transforming days of the dawning of the church? Oh, they sure do. The church was filled with truth. It was filled with faith, love, generosity, passion for the lost. It was an exciting time. And on top of it, there was this, all this hope. Hmm. Some of you fall a little short of these days. And it was all influenced by the teaching and the preaching of the apostles, those associated with them. But even in the purity of these days that were based on the infancy of the church, even in those early days, the apostles were given by the Holy Spirit the privilege of looking into the future. And even the not too distant future, in mere fact. The Holy Spirit allowed these apostles to see something that was absolutely frightening. Something that was absolutely terrifying, mystifying, and frankly, to most people, unbelievable. What was that? That apostasy would come into the church. There'd be a falling away from the Lord. How could these people even 
digest that. These were times of up times, great times. The church is being packed. More people are joining the church than ever. People are getting saved on a daily basis, being baptized in the Jordan, you know, basically just saying, hey, put my name down too, Roman centurion. I'm getting baptized for Jesus. Who cares? These were times of absolute boldness. But now the Spirit shows some of these apostles that in some of those days that are coming up, sinners would be judged. The believers would be raptured. People would be taken to glory. My goodness. What did the Holy Spirit continue to prophesy at that point? That Jesus would return? Yep. That one day the world would be restored? Yep. Sinners would be judged? Yep. Believers would be raptured? Yep. They would be rewarded? Yep. There'd be a messianic kingdom of glory and that Christ would reign in it? Yep. There would eventually be a new heaven and a new earth? Yep. That the gospel would even be preached to the ends of the earth? Yep. That the church would grow and flourish? Yep. But in the midst of all that, this apostasy would come to rest. That it would become this, even the gospel itself in these last days. The gospel would become converted. Are you checking out the game film here right now? That it would abandon the gospel and abandon Christ. Jesus would be reduced from Savior and Lord and the Son of God to just another prophet and a good guy who's saying some nice things. Sound familiar? Are you checking the game film? Congregations, in those days, were euphoric for what was happening with God. There were days of miracles and proclaiming the gospel fearlessly and being persecuted for it. And people were saying, bring it on. Bring on the martyrdom. Bring on the evangelism. Bring, bring on the days of turning this world upside down. We want to live in the glow and of, of being transformed in the life that comes. And Jude enters into this picture and he says, okay, in spite of all of that, the days are coming. I want to show you on the game film here that the enemy's going to come to play. You need to be ready. He's going to attack you. The first thing he says in verse 17 is, remember your prediction. Here's where Satan starts to attack our intelligence. You know, I said, I've said i said this, and I know PF Pastor said it a long time ago. In fact, John MacArthur said this. He said, Listen to a preacher, and you'll know what's in his heart. That's simple, John says. They want to talk about material prosperity? <laughs> that's what's in their heart. They want to talk about personal satisfaction and fulfillment? That's what's in their heart. I think Johnny Mac's right there. And then John goes on to say, he says, and all of that is simply their inability to cover up their own self-indulgence. You know, this had to be about the biggest, I think, prophetic shock of all predictions about the future that were deposited upon the minds and ears of the early church. Unimaginable that people could depart from the real truth. But that's what the apostles said, that they would actually go so far as to mock the gospel and then pursue their own godly, ungodly lust. You know, 25 years after Jude wrote his book, John wrote his book from the Isle of Patmos. And even in Revelation, what do we read about the seven churches? They, re they received both commendation and condemnation. Already, some of the apostasy had started to come in. Already, the second century Gnostics were beginning to, to permeate into the church. They even even a something as silly, as silly as this of a docetic Christ. It was like Jesus wasn't real. He was just an apparition. You're wondering what Dan Brown writes about in his novels. It's about a docetic Christ. Those letters 
were included in those first, the second and third chapter of Revelation. Those letters the Lord sends through John, we learn that the prophecies of the apostles had already started to come to pass 25 years after the heyday of the church. And we're going to continue for some time and continue now into our age. Even the church of Pergamos was filled with corruption, immorality, heresy. The church of Thyatira is so wicked that the Lord threatens to kill some of them. The Sardis church is totally dead, murdered by apostates who defected from the church and from the truth. And then there is that famous Laodicean church that makes the Lord so sick, he wants to he gets so nauseated, he wants to vomit them out of his mouth. These, these are pretty descriptive things, aren't they? We know that Satan's up to that. We know that Satan wants to sow seeds of discord in churches. And when he starts to do it, we need to be wise enough to say, gotcha. I know what you're up to here. It isn't long until the story of the church become, became a dark and a story of the church became gloomy and the smell of death is present and foreboding doomed works in the air around the church. I don't have to tell this educated audience that we're not proud of some of the history of the church through the ages. These first century apostles knew it was coming. It's as if the church had not even looked at some of the games then. And when the fiery ordeals came upon them, they were so surprised. That's why Peter writes in his, in his book, he says, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeals overtake you. Don't get shocked. You should have been watching the game film. You should have known. Then he says in this verse 17, there's going to be scoffers. There's going to be people who satisfy their ungodly desires. There are people who are going to be creating divisions among you. They want to follow their natural instincts. These are the ones, and he has, he has one more of these in here, one more reflection on them. These are the ones who cause division. The New American Standard says it this way, they're worldly minded but devoid of the Spirit. That's very interesting, this this. this this whole deal here, how he translates this. These are the, they always are the ones who claim to have the Spirit and think anybody who doesn't agree with them, you know, they're, they're the wrong ones. But they're the ones who cause the divisions. Now, I want, I want to talk about that because it's a very elusive idea if you get down to the actual Greek word here. And sometimes seminary can be very helpful here. But apostates always cause divisions. They always proselytize. They never evangelize. They always create divisions. They're divisive. No question about that. But there's more than, than just that effect. There is the essence of the particular pattern. The verb here is abrizo, which means, and it's only here, it's what we call the hapax legomeno, which means it's the only time it's ever used. It is. It means to make a distinction. It's not so much that they create division. Apostates do that. That's the effect of false teaching. The truth and lies are separate. But the idea here is that they make the distinction. Put it simply, they believe they're superior. They believe that they're above and beyond. They're like the Pharisees. And they despise anyone in the church who has authority. I went through this in the 60s when the whole nation became kind of anti-authority. Demonstrations broke out all over the place. Many of us couldn't understand it in the church. But here it is in Scripture. It's people who despise authority and want to become the authority. No wonder the Bible is filled with admonition to children to honor your parents, to obey them. For a husband and wife, to submit one to another and recognize the authority and the co-submission co to each other. There's no wonder that in the church, the people are to be under the leadership of the spiritual leaders of the church, whether it's elders or deacons or whatever it may be. Submit yourself one to another. To be under the lordship of Jesus Christ is a powerful thing. And we live in a nation today who wants no authority. In some ways, this political situation today is a joke. 
I've never in all my 70-some years seen political theater like I've seen it this time. You know, it's like you wake up in the morning and, and your, your phone has got five things on it already of who said what and to whom. The apostates are always on the edge of division. They believe that they have arrived at the truth and they are successful at duping people. It just feeds their egotism. They feel like they're the elite. And from the seventh chapter of John, the text reads some of this like this. None of you, of course, believes in Jesus, only the stupid people who don't know the law. That's what the Pharisees say. They're condescending. They make a separation between themselves and everybody else. They have their own standards, their own set of rules. I told you that the apostates would divide, but they do it because they're devoid of the Spirit when they think they have the Spirit. That's why Jesus said, you who are in the darkness, who think you're in the light, oh, how great is the darkness. Jude designates them in the very same way. They think they're at elevated levels. What the Gnostics became. They scoff at the simple things of the church. They scoff at those who take the word of God at face value and then endeavor to obey it. They think they're fools. I sat in a pastor's meeting of a area-wide meeting of Douglas County of pastors. One pastor leaned over to another pastor as I walked in and said, I could hear, I could hear him. And he said, I think he's the interim pastor on the St. Baptist Department. Oh. Then he said this. I'm in earshot now, but he thinks I can't hear him. But I can't. Even at 73, I can hear. And this is what he says. They still believe in the Bible over there. Setting them himself as the superior person in the world. And I said to myself, I should have said it out loud. Come to Golden next week and hear my message for First Baptist. Gotcha. Thank you. Somebody's paying attention over there. Awesome. They condemn true believers as non-intellectual or lacking in faith, not being elevated. Remember 3 John, verse 9, maybe you don't. Theosophies, maybe was one of those who loved to have what? Preeminence. They cause division, but even more than that, they they have an elevated opinion of themselves. They see themselves as elite, and they're the only true teacher. Sometimes this happens even in churches. It happens in denominations. It happens to your favorite TV guy, your favorite radio guy, game show. We need to watch it. We need to remember the prediction of the apostles. We need to remember the prediction of the apostles. And so you see, while they're claiming to be transcendental, claiming to see God, know God, talk with God, and get all these revelations of God, the scripture says that they are only sukos, not noma. Noma was the spirit that was only given to humans that could reason and think and have relationships. Sukos is to every other living thing that's devoid of the spirit. I'm sorry, your dog and cat is not going to heaven. They're sukos. Numa is for human beings. It's a precious, sacred sanctity. Vision comes in. And these people who are apostates, the Bible says they're operating out of sukos, not numo. There are Absolutely devoid of the Spirit. And the truth of the matter is that they are physically alive, but these people are spiritually dead. They're flesh dominated, religious frauds. They parade their religion, they parade their spirituality, 
They offer themselves as a spokesman for God and a spokesman for Christ, as interpreters of the Bible, but they're only sucrose, they're not. And, 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 and Jude reminds us, the game film is hell. The game film exposes these people. Remember the prediction. Number two, here comes the attack on the supply. Build up each other in the most holy faith. Like 1 Corinthians 3.12 says, in gold, silver, precious stones, not wood, hay, or stubble. Encourage one another. Hebrews puts it this way, encourage one another today while it's still called today that you might be kept from the deceitfulness of sin. Wow. How is it going in the encouragement department? Satan's strategy, his game film says he wants to discourage, he wants to take encouragement out of the church. We're pretty good at telling each other what to do and what not to do, but how about coming around one another and encouraging one another, building each other up in the faith, talking to each other. How many of you are part of the life groups and how many part of the home Bible studies and, 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 and becoming uh, uh, acquainted with what's going on after this service and getting yourself into the Word and becoming a self-feeder during the day and having devotions, helping to encourage one another to build each other up in the faith. How's that going? I've got time to move through a few more here, but let's keep going. Verse 20, he says the third thing is to pray in the Spirit. This is the communication. Intelligence, supply, now communication, to pray in the Spirit. That is, under His guidance and influence, according to the rule of His Word, with faith, and fervency, and constant persevering. This is praying in the Holy Spirit. Removed by the nudgings and the compelling of the Spirit of God. How's that going? He wants to just wreck your prayer life. And yet we're called to pray in the Spirit and to pray according to the nudgings and the promptings of the Spirit. Then I've got two that attack in verses 21 and 22. It says, anticipate the mercy of our Lord. And then in verse 22a it says, show mercy to the wavering. Both of those attack vulnerable areas. In anticipating the mercy of the Lord in 21a, it says, take heed of throwing yourselves out of the love of God or its delightful, cheering, strengthening manifestations. Keep yourself in the way of God. Isn't that interesting, the word the way of God? You know what that means? It's actually the Greek word for reality. Don't invent a reality of your own. Don't invent a God as you think He might be defined. Let Scripture define it. If Scripture is defining your experience, that's exegesis. For you to read your experience into Scripture, that's eisegesis. And that's what we do sometimes. We invent our own realities. We, invent, we take our experience, whatever it is, and we read it and try, to, and try to have Scripture define that. No, let Scripture define your experience. Don't get out of the way of God. Anticipate the mercy of the Lord. Sometimes if we don't think God has had mercy, it's because the situation didn't come out the way I thought it should. I'm convinced that all things work together for good to those who love and trust Him. Why? Because those are the people who understand the nature of God. Maybe it's time today to go back to your library and take off and take out that old systematic theology book from Burkhoff. Or if you haven't bought a systematic theology, get Charnack's two-volume series, The Old Puritan. He'll tell you about the nature of God. Because as you get to understand the nature of God, as you understand who He is, you'll never be disappointed in one circumstance in your life. I guarantee it. The hope will be there that goes beyond all reason and hope in the world. But some of us get disappointed and some of us even get disappointed with God because something didn't come out the way we thought it should. That's not God's problem. That actually is your problem because you're not really understanding the nature of God. Now, these are tough things today. I want you to look at the game film because this is where the enemy is going to nail you. But when you see what the nature of God is like and you begin to understand how he works and you start seeing all things running becoming uh, working together for good because you love and trust him and are called in according to his purpose 
and you expose Satan for it is for who he is, that's a time where you turn to Satan, you turn to your husband, you turn to your wife, you turn to your kids and your family, and it's one big gotcha. We knew that was coming. We saw that one coming a mile away. Got anything better? This is a serious time for us, gang. And then it says, to show mercy to the wavering. Boy, I love this. There's a lot of people in churches today, a lot of people in your neighborhood who are wavering, a little nervous. I remember when I was coaching football, I had a kid that was so talented. But in this particular game, after three quarters, he had gotten his bell rung two times. We didn't have concussion protocol back in those days. I don't think he had a concussion, but he could tell that his, his shoulders were drooping. Even with shoulder pads on, they looked like they were slumped. You could see it in his eyes. He was kind of devoid of that fire that he once had. And I finally put my arm around him and said, listen, I want to tell you who you are, son. You're the best player on this team. When I want someone to go to, it's you. I believe in you, son. I believe you have everything going. I know you've taken some major hits. You took a couple good pops out there. But you're still standing, son. Now right now, not only do I need you, your whole your teammates need you. And whether we win or lose this game is not the issue for this, son. The issue is whether or not you believe in yourself, in your teammates, in me, and I believe in you, and you accept that. And more importantly, you and I are Christians, son. You know, we're part of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes here in this group. A lot of people watching right now. A lot of people concerned to see what you're going to do. Not whether you're going to win or lose right now, but how you're going to react to this adversary and all this adversity in your country. What do you say we go back into that game and we believe who we really are? Children of God who have been called to play to a football game right now so that we might witness to the glory and the power of Kim's son is out there. That kid, I, I, I swear, his shoulders popped up. He said, Coach, I'm there. That guy for the next five minutes, I don't know what happened. I don't think it was that great a speech myself. But something happened to that kid. This guy became a one-man wrecking crew. He came over to the sidelines after about five minutes, and we were back in the game. And then I said, you and I watched the game film, didn't we, Monday night? Yeah. You know what they're going to do? I know what they're going to do. He said, they're going to drop back that. And we, we didn't call it cover two in that, in that day. We called it zone. He said, they're going back into zone three, and they're going to let that wide receiver go out there. I got it, Coach. He did. He stepped back, waited, poised, and then broke for it like a guy had just stole something. He <laughs> intercepted that ball. I thought I thought he jumped ten feet in the air. I'm sure it wasn't that high. It just seemed that way. Grabbed that ball out of that receiver's hand and went down the sidelines for 80 yards and we win the game. He threw the ball down as I was replaying that tape in my head this week. I wish he had said, gotcha. He didn't. <laughs> but I know if he had a chance to say it today, he would. Some of you have had friends who have gone through cancer. And they didn't make it. But they were believers. And they're laying on that bed. And somehow, at that moment, just before you go home, how many of you have heard stories where they just know that the Christ is coming like Jim Elliot, the martyr in 1956, or the Rockwood Indians, and they saw the angels of the Lord coming to get him. I can't help but think of those people who have died, who've been our loved ones, who've been on deathbeds, and God is coming for them. And the last thing they say, rough translation, gotcha, I'm going home. You didn't get me, I got you. 
I watched the film. I knew this was going to happen. Satan does not get our vulnerable areas. Last is security, and that's in verse 22b. It says, rescue others with caution. we got to do all we can to save people. Snatch them. This is so graphic in Jews. It's like, you're, it's like you're, you're reaching over a pit and hell is down there and you're grabbing people from the flames. I mean, that's not a picture that's real popular today. You know what I'm saying? But that might be where your neighbors are right now. Metaphorically. Some of them are going down for the third time. And, and, and gang, you, you've got the answer. You know Jesus as your Savior. You, you've got the answer to eternal life. I don't know what it takes to, to motivate you, but let me just say, like I said to that young man some years ago, I believe in you. God believes in you. God has given you His Spirit. It's given you for power and for life, for hope and for meaning. And then on top of it, He even gave you some game film to watch, Scripture, and said, here's what's going to happen. Be ready, in season and out of season. Know what the enemy's coming after. And when he does, and when you present the gospel, and you see people come to faith, I can't think of a greater time that when you give a, when God allows you the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, and as they become a brother and sister to you in the faith, that you can't help but whisper as you're driving home. <laughs> gotcha. I knew you'd throw everything at my neighbor, my friend, my beloved, but we ought to do everything we can to rescue others out of the snares of the devil that they might be saved. Help each other to rescue them from sin that entangles them, dangerous errors and practices. Thank God for a pastoral staff, and thank you for allowing me to preach every once in a while to make sure that we as a staff stay on track and preach the truth. Amen? Amen. And when we do, and the truth is here, and the light is shined, what happens to the darkness when light comes in? It gets dispelled. That's why it's so important to have His reality, not something we make up. Let me conclude with just saying this. We are often apt to overdo things sometimes. And when we mean to do something honestly, and we think we're right in the main, and we're not doing it rationally or with extremity, but we still need to always bring whatever our thinking is to the Word of God. Because it is God's truth that prevails. It is God's truth that exposes. And when His truth exposes and the light comes on, we see the situation for what it is. And we look at the person or the things that are bogus. And inside we don't gloat. We don't become preeminent ourselves or egotistical ourselves. But we say quietly to the evil. Gotcha. I saw the game film. I knew this was coming. And I was right. Amen. And amen. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for this morning. Make us mindful that you are the one true God. And that all of that is in your hands. Nothing else and no one else has been given preeminence over this world. Thank you that when your light is shines and shines well upon our situations, you expose the darkness, you expose the fraud, you expose it all. And I'm so glad that you do. Because everyone I know in this room, all my brothers and sisters here, I know they want to walk in truth. They want to walk in the light. So that we can 
We can have fellowship with you and with one another. That's the greatest call of our life. And like the days in the first century, would you allow things here at First Baptist to just explode? As we sit under the teaching of your word and the fellowship with one another, may you bring about revival right here in the city of Golden. That's our desire, Lord. That we would be so ready and so aware of the wiles and the schemes of the devil that we've watched enough game film that we know where we need to put our efforts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.